Yeah, thank you, Paul Worker and the team, to invite me to this uh, honorable meeting. It's a great pleasure to summarize some of our experience on radiotherapy. And uh, the talk takes about 5% of the whole symposium. And uh, so I have to make my marks uh, within this short period for a completely new aspect of treatment of dipitrans. Um, certainly, I have a lot, lot of conflicts of interest declaration, no conflicts with uh, the non-malignant conditions, a couple of uh, conditions related to uh, radiotherapy and radio-oncology, but a lot of conflicts with my family, which has to have lack of me today, and my wife, my daughter, my sons, and the cat, Felix. Um, you may ask, what has a radiation therapist to do with dipitrans, and uh, why I have explored in that field. I had uh, 1985 to 87 exposure uh, to benign conditions with Luther Brady in Philadelphia. Um, I then returned back and uh, was tutor of the first uh, MD thesis on dipitrans in the University of Erlangen, and so we presented the first publication uh, from Erlangen together with Ludwig Keilholz. Then I moved to Essen, and from that on, I was able to compose a randomized clinical study comparing two radiotherapy schedules and asking for comparison with a control group. And uh, finally, in 2010, I moved to Stahlen Zentrum Hamburg, and I have built up an international X-ray clinic with over 300 patients coming from abroad to receive treatment at our site. So in 30 years, I have seen more than 1,000 patients and have examined 1,500 1, hand and feet. Um, the question is, uh, why can radiation therapy prevent progression? Uh, first of all, my own professional exposure over time, I have learned to take the whole body as an examining uh, part. So don't only look for the hands. Uh, and the podiatrist don't look for feet, look for bows, look for shoulders, ask the man for Peyronie's disease and plus plus risk factors and so on. So from that on, I developed a standard documentation which I have now for over 25 years and a database which contains all these data. By reflecting my own experience, I've learned a lot and I've also seen radiotherapy failures, which everybody can make um, in the first five years learning, and I'm still learning. <clears throat> Looking why radiotherapy may work, we have a couple of uh, in, di diagnoses which work very well and are proven from lower doses, Peyronie's disease, up to heterotopic ossification, this is bone formation, uh, keloids, pterygium relapse in the eye, a very nice study, up to aggressive fibromatosis, where you would need doses of 50 to 60 gray. But what is then the cause for the action radiotherapy can affect dubitron and letter host disease. And that's important to understand that radiotherapy affects both the inflammation through endothelial cells and lymphocytes, and as well as proliferation by interfering with fibroblasts. There's a lot of in vitro and in vivo study already taking place which go directly into a proof mechanisms for the action of radiotherapy. Um, a very old study by Mario showed that the number of nodules correlates directly with the role of fibroblasts. And the fibroblasts them, themselves are undergoing proliferation to the point where they finally go into a post-mitotic status, not proliferating anymore. If you look into the different tissues like tendon or scar, you see a very low cellularity. However, in nodules and cords, you see a high cellularity uh, containing many fibroblasts and their activities. Yes, we can, because both the cords and the nodules contain cellules which are radiosensitive. This is the type of action. Usually, if you see, these are the myofibroblasts coming from stem cell pool and then going, undergoing several proliferations to myofibroblasts type 2 and type 3, and finally undergoing into a post-mitotic phase. This is mostly driven by TGF-beta, and TGF-beta is a very sensitive factor to radiotherapy. 
And by interfering with radiation, we basically do a shortcut from MF1 directly to the post-mitotic fibroblast, the same MF2 or MF3. So at any stage you have proliferating myofibroblasts or fibroblasts, you directly put them into the post-mitotic phase. And that's the key mechanism and action of radiotherapy proven in many studies, like this one, where, where I looked for clonogenic activity and radio, uh, radiation sensitivity of TGF-beta cow O fibroblasts. And as you can see, non-irradiated um, samples versus the irradiated samples with five gray, you could see a completely down-regulating of the surviving fractions independent of the type of uh, days uh, the application was given. And I don't want to summarize many of the other studies, but in general, we can determine that TGF beta plays an essential role in the process of radiation-induced re reduction of the lymphocyte adhesion to endothelial cells, so the inflammatory component, but also in cell proliferation uh, of fibroblasts from ionizing radiation. So we have two key issues, the inflammatory aspect as well as the proliferation aspect, which are regulated by radiotherapy. So then the question is, who may benefit from radiotherapy? And you know all the epidemiological studies, you know that disease might be quiescent, you may know there are certain signs of progression, clinical signs, by examination, and you have to follow the patient over a certain period of time by re-examining. To, and to finally find out, yes, he is in a progressive state. And so the question is, throughout the life of months, years, and decades, we have certain situations where we actually measure function. That's what, what's done by hand surgeons. Uh, they measure the lack of extension. So the tabletop test is uh, significant. But there are many other signs available in this period up to the level of 10 degree. And so the question is, usually you observe it until they reach a certain level of function loss, probably around 45 degree. So this is the land of the surgeon. This is the unknown land, and this is a possible land of prevention. So the question is, no treatment in the developing disease period, no treatment here, but clearly this is hand surgery. And radiotherapy does not belong in that region. So radiotherapy and surgery are complementary and not competitive. That's an important message. Because in that stage, when you enter into the operative period, you, un you know exactly that there are periods of relapses in the long run, up to 50%, have second and third operations. And the question again is, when you interfere with surgery, you may induce proliferation healing processes, which may stimulate the disease again. So what is important? To really define what is progression. And from my perspective in examination, and that's the, uh, the charts which I usually use, an increased number of nodules over time, an increased number of cords, increased symptoms, itching, some other sensitivity changes, loss of finger spread, loss of extension, and loss of practical activities. I can tell you among the thousand patients, I have at least two symphony orchestras which want to preserve their function at the fullest range. Piano players, I have three magicians, one which is very famous even here in Netherlands, who want to preserve his fifth, fifth finger to hide cards behind the others. So there's very explicit functions which patients want to preserve and not to wait until surgery. And so the question is, if we induce radiotherapy at an earlier point, which is progressive, we may avoid progression we may delay progression, and both will help that surgery comes in to a later time in the whole lifespan of a patient. And so these are the lands I would divide. The land of radiotherapy probably with minor extension up to 10 degree, progressive nodules and cords in a proven time span. Probably some radiotherapy still remaining in 20 or 30 degree, but probably this is the land of the surgeon. And you have to fight out if you want minimal surgery, if you want invasive surgery, at which level. And this land is still not fully divided in your part. But this part is probably not the part of the surgeon. So we are not competitors. 
The question now is again, if we look in published data, you see some distribution in different stages, stage one, stage two, and stage three. So we have experience in treating these uh, stages. And what comes clearly out over time, these stages are not successfully treated. You have progress in treated 25 to 50%, and in these stages, 50 to 75%. So it doesn't make sense to treat these cases. But it makes sense to treat and avoid progress in the end stage, and probably in some smaller deficits in stage one. There are two major groups who have pro, um, basically given knowledge to the uh, concepts, which is the group of Erlangen, where I've learned the situation, five times three gray, but never done a controlled study, and the group in Essen, where we compared a control group over the same time period with two schedules of radiotherapy, seven times three gray and 10 times three gray. And certainly, as you can see, this is a patient who is presenting to us. This is the status not being treated, waited and waited, now requiring surgery. I would not treat this patient. And so it's clear, this is no RT, but here radiotherapy is possible, and he's a bilateral case, and he wants to avoid that situation. And certainly, he has disease on the fifth, on the fifth up to the first finger. By careful examination, you see the whitish areas, you see the changes in the folding, you see different spans, V-shaped, U-shaped. So you have a lot of clinical signs, and if a patient sends me a photograph like this, you have a very clear indication that this patient might need radiotherapy. And this is the design of the study. We had observation, a control group. During the same time, patients came, they were counseled, they decided not to receive radiotherapy, and were followed and the randomization took place between the two radiotherapy schedules. So again, in the total survey, and this is the survey up to 2009, we have all patients now in five years follow-up look in surgical studies who can present data with five years follow-up. I didn't find many in the literature. But here we have 612 patients, 511 into the radiotherapy group and 101 in the control group. And a total of 258 patients in this and in here. Final evaluation done in November 2014. All were treated with auto-voltage radiotherapy. There's, by the way, there's no difference if you treat properly between electrons or between auto -volt. You just have to cover the right depth and you cover the area in terms of space. Which is, this is the examination. Patient himself just said, I have an area here. But if you examine carefully, you see nodules all over. So this is the treatment field, and we extend usually two centimeters beyond the margins of nodules, which we have detected. So be more generously in the first two series. And if you look now into patient parameters, control versus the two groups, you don't find any difference in the control group, which are followed over the same time period, in terms of family, ladder hose, garret, perineum, frozen shoulder, or keloid scars. No difference. And in terms of the number of nodules, there is no change, again, in these different groups. However, if you look into the hand parameters, then for the 612 patients, 880 hands, you see a small difference that because of a larger component of patients being in the stage one to four, or let's say three to four group in this group. But this is the only significant difference for a smaller number of patients. These are the results. The acute effects are about 25% of the patients, but they are fading away. They remain with dry skin in about 15%, but you can leave that with creams, and patients are not complaining. No ulcers, no cancers observed so far. 139 sites had a remission of nodules, so a small amount remit. Another type is stable, and we have about 30% progression. 194 required surgery in the whole group. The control group had to a much larger amount of required hand surgery versus the 8% in the group A and the 14% in group B. So overall, this is a statistically significant difference with regard to surgery for the same groups, uh, for the same time intervals, and uh, less progression, again, significant. If we look into the prognostic factors, we see compared to the control, 
significant T stage. Also, uh, the relapses inside and outside. Surgery was always possible, but it was no increased complication like you have complicated anyway. So we have two or three surgeons who have followed these cases uh, on those places now in Hamburg with Professor Preiser and in Essen with Professor Koop and uh, Dr. Stephens. The most important prognostic factor was the use of radiotherapy. Prognostic factors, and in summary, uni and multivariate analysis are clear set. The recommended concept for dipitrans is 10 times three gray in two series, about two 12 weeks break, best results. I now skip with the uh, situation to Lederhos. You can read that in the abstracts. But in general, we can say radiotherapy is effective in early Dupuytren and Lederhos disease with low side effects. Radiotherapy reduces necessity of later intervention. Long-term follow-up of five years is required for final assessment in all studies, also in surgical studies. And radiotherapy may be efficient with lower doses, so some may choose that, but it's a slightly uh, less successful protocol than with 10 times 3 gray. We are now starting together with uh, selected surgeons to give radiotherapy in cases with um, operation in the pinky finger, 90 degree or more, uh, to help surgeons to avoid early relapse. And that's part of our ongoing study, which may be coming out five years or later because that's necessary to follow these patients. But there are hand surgeons now in Germany who would like to get radiotherapy at least once series for um, providing long-term control for their hands. So in my opinion, uh, if we go from 2015 on, we have to have a look beyond the usual horizon of surgeon and look that we will have helping hands and functioning feet, and as you see, they already have a crumped finger, and they have a nodule here on the foot. So hopefully this will be an onset for many to start in the study, and I also want to say hand surgeons are my friends, and I have many of them, uh, with whom I com uh, collaborate friendly enough, because I have problems and you have problems, and we may solve these questions in future trials. Thank you.